Harry Biker Dave Myers joins us on the How To Be 60 podcast this week. He's funny, fabulous, and after his cancer diagnosis last year, philosophical. It, it's a funny thing, chemotherapy. It's, I suppose it's one of life's great levels, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? doesn't matter whether you're on the telly or you're on the dole. You get that, you're in the shit. And I'm wondering how to be 60. It's scaring the shit out of me. So time for a look at a life beyond the big six oh with Karen McKenzie and friends. As we call it, <laughs> not that what I'm like better. The sound of that. A nice ring to that. Do you like it? I get to like that. Yeah. Very much. I, I've given. Are you happy with it? No, I've, I've given up. I accept, you know, that, that you're the star of the show and, and I'm just good, good. for that. Um, well, it's only teeny months. I know, I know. But, you know, I, I think that's one of my better qualities that I can, you know. Your only qualities. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How are things at the Giftnock Theatre Players? Well, I've only been up there twice. The first time time was to paint the flats as they call them that's the stage set the second time was to repaint the flats which would cocked up basically in the first what you do you put you paint yeah well it's a set for the slab boys and i think it's based in a paint workshop or something so the idea was that the set was kind of splattered with paint brushes you know and they met the guys wiping their paint brushes so but then we realized actually nobody's going to paint their or wipe their brush 10 feet up so we then had to go paint over their splashes and we ran out of paint and oh god god all right that's i was going to ask you if you would like to paint the poster for the how to be 60 sign but maybe <laughs> um maybe i won't do that after but, all no yeah yeah no so. um our guest today might be able to dave myers yeah harry biker of course but man of many many talents studied fine art at it's goldsmith stint. Award-winning makeup artist, as well as, of course, being very well known as a cook. He's not just a hairy face, you know. I know. You get that? <laughs> I was good. No, I don't. Is that a joke? But that was a joke. No, just a hairy face. Yeah, rather, you're not just a pretty face, not just a hairy right. face. Right. Right. Don't do oh my jokes. Christ! It's going to I thought you knew that I didn't do jokes. <laughs> but I used to hate being on Radio Scotland with this comedian. I'm finding it just quite disconcerting the way you keep rubbing your belly like that. You're it's like it's in the hot water bottle. I know, but you're like an old lady who's pining after pregnancy or something. You just the way that you keep stroking it and you know. liking it's quite nice and cozy though under my jump. Yeah. Anyway, I've no, got to do jokes. I've got good news. Uh huh. I think I'm getting better at hobbies. Oh my god, have you actually created one or have you got one? Um, well, funnily enough, you know Joe Brand was saying that she has started to read more. I know yes. it's not a big thing to start uh-huh. with, but I'm definitely I used to only read on holidays. Now I am definitely reading as part of my life. Um And can you remember the books that you're reading? I can. I read Prince Harry's Spare. Oh, I remember that. Oof. Um I just read one by Carrie Marshall, a radio oh, colleague. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, yes. How to Kill a Man, about oh, lovely. Um, her journey as, as a trans woman. Uh-huh. That was very interesting. Oh, just finished Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. No, Extremely I interesting. I this. It's got a good rep, yep. isn't it? Yeah, really would recommend it. Yeah, um, actually. And I was looking for another one because I've just finished those. <laughs> and so I picked up this book <laughs> that you gave me for my birthday. Aha, uh-huh, I did, Key. Which is called Don't Hold My Head Down in uh-huh. front of me. And I thought, oh, don't hold my head down. What is it about? Is, is this it about cool? cold water swimming? <laughs> yes. Is it about first aid if you're feeling oh, dizzy? All oh, right, person. right. You got a bleeding nose. But then on the back we have Lucy Ann Holmes felt like a novice when it came to sex. But when she tried to find out what she could do about it, she realised everything she googled was geared to male pleasure rather than to woman's. Determined not to let the stop her, Lucy penned a list and set out to discover what her sex life was missing. Mm-hmm. Why did you give me this? I just thought, you know, when you've been 25 years with the one person. 30. 30. God, well, you know, I think it's it's good to broaden your uh, reading culture in terms of that kind of book and I thought it might say <laughs> that kind of book <laughs> it might help you and I don't know might throw a few ideas into the old sex life with Ian have you read it I have have you got any hints from it yes what did you get oh when I say hints to tell you the truth I've don't read... start getting coy now 
there was a bit in it with a bit of advice and how she did something. And I thought, oh, I'll try that. What was it? <laughs> Listen, don't, if you're, if you're embarrassed about Dave. I am Dave, embarrassed. Don't no, be embarrassed about Dave because he spent no. 20 odd years in a TV makeup room. And I can tell you, any man who spends 20 years in a TV makeup room, oh, unembarrassable. I know. No, what I'm embarrassed about is that although Stephen doesn't listen to this podcast, the entire office does. Right. And after the vibrator story, I'm not going there. So <laughs> I can't. I can't. But suffice to say, Stephen said, ooh, that's nice. Oh, come on. You've got to tell us what it is. Like, no, what page is it? What read page is it? I didn't earmark it. That is your book. bloody dead. No, 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 no. I've got my own book. Well, let me see. I'm just going to skim it. Now you've got me going. That. Orgasms, Pleasure and Power. Lucy's old masturbatory. All right, I know where we're going. I know where we're going. Okay, I will read it. Will you? I will read it and I will see if I could come in and say, right, I know the bit that you were talking about. Yeah, don't come back to me without putting something into practice. But, don't you lecture to me, lady. I'll wait and see. I'm it's funny how you mentioned um, vibrators because I saw this story and it really made me think of you. Um, this is a genuine story. Police in Spain are investigating a robbery of the biggest haul of sex toys that they have ever recovered, including such a seven, sexy. wait for it, seven solid gold vibrators. Good. Apparently bound for Marbella and Paris. Oh, my God. Yep. It's really heavy. Yes. And cold. Yes. <laughs> and did I say hard? Inflexible. Yeah. <laughs> like yourself, Kate. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus. Did they frame them? Apparently, no. 16,000 euros each. They're worth. There you, you sell go. them in the gold market. Oh, my. I wow. mean, so so obviously they love them in Marbella and Paris. I mean, Dave comes from Barrow and Furnace. I don't know <laughs> if they've got any gold vibrators there or not. In fact, there was another story about vibrators in the, in the news this week. It was about an old Do you have a Google one. alert on vibrators? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> but at first they saw this and they thought it was one of those. Well, must it you're darning in next week, actually. It was. They thought it was one of those, um, like a mushroom-shaped tool that you you put into your tool, like sock or whatever you're going to darn. You know, it's like a. Anyway, uh, hang on, stop, stop, stop. Are we talking about vibrators yeah, or darning? It was a wooden one. It was a wooden, and they then realised it was BBC News. They then realised it was um, old wooden vibrators from way back in the day. I'm so totally, I'm that. totally confused. I'm totally confused. Well, I'm just saying there's two vibrator stories in the news this week. So wait a minute. What what is the mushroom? Do you know what? Rather than a mushroom, it, it, it they thought it was for darning. It looked like oh, the, right. you know, the thing that wig wig bam. I was going to say wham bam bam. Even the Flintstones, that tool that she had that she used to a hammer whack off the the baby. Used to whack off. The, this isn't going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Think, right. Okay. Six, I thought, I'd like this. Yeah. 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 Women trying mm-hmm. to. Yeah. Um, well, we we can ask we can definitely ask Dave about the the gold vibrators. Well, he'll be fine on that. I know he'll be fine on that. TV makeup room, TV makeup room. The other thing that makes me know that Dave is going to be totally unshockable is that he's got his own podcast with Cy King, uh, the other hairy biker called The Agony. Of- yeah, I've heard it. It's brilliant. I, I really do enjoy <laughs> it. I really do. If you're going to listen to any other podcast people, uh, then I would recognize uh, recommend The Agony Uncles. <laughs> And and they give really good advice because I thought it would just be all kind of jokey and it is a lot of us, but there's really good advice. I mean, there's real content to it, you know, unlike our podcast, which is generally <laughs> shit. But I, I was going to ask Dave about Charles. Do you remember that dilemma we got about Charles? Oh, is that from a great marriage or something or great divorce or something? Yeah, basically he wanted to yeah. sort of have fun and just spend their money and travel, etc. And his wife wanted to... Sort of keep her part time job, keep the money. What did you think? Yes. Remember, we asked Sue Cleaver about it. Yes, yes, yes. And I think basically we all just told Charles to get rid of the wife. Not in that kind of illegal way. <laughs> no, not not do away with the wife. No. You know, just, just to sort of get rid yeah. of the wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we can ask him about that as well as the gold vibrators. Yeah. Right. Should we do some Eva, Amy, yeah, or them yeah. speak to? Today yeah. he's going to be champing at the bit. When are you going to let me read it and email? I'm not saying I want to do it today, but you've actually sort of taken over the whole. Would you show like again? Okay. Um. Well, not this week, but I will consider your application. Okay. It was a point. I was allowed to read it. The bingo. The well, you could do that. Well. But listen, at this one from Francis, I've just scanned it. It's got quite a lot of big words in it with uh, up to five syllables. So I don't think you're going to struggle with it. Is that what you're saying? I don't yeah, think you're warning us for you to start on. Eat it. <laughs> Shut it. <laughs> Hi, Kay and Karen. The pair of you keep me going. I'm 60 now and since being diagnosed with fibromyalgia eight years ago. This is an interesting email, actually. 
I've gone from being a fit, strong, active, sexy beast to a sedentary person who enjoys a comfortable seat. The ageing process was disguised by the illness. I've now accepted my limits and find great joy in things that I can do. Sometimes I have a laugh at the prospect of having a partner and how they'd have to not talk to me after six in the evening. Um, Sex would be out of the question because I'd be so knackered I wouldn't be able to cook my tea for a week afterwards. Despite everything, I think I have a contentment and a happiness in life that I never had before. All the best, Francis. And I I really love that, Francis. Thanks very much for email. I genuinely love that email because a lot of the aging process, you could think, oh, what if I can't do this? What if I can't do that? What if that's taken away from me? And to have acceptance. I know. And happiness. I mean, some people feel cheated by age. I think I'll probably feel cheated by age. You think? Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Well, that's why you need to start doing things the enjoy key. On that note, this is another email here. This is from Nikki in the Isle of Wight. Do you remember Nikki in the Isle of Wight got in touch? We had two. Is that the burlesque? No, no, no she, she's the other one. Two people in the Isle of Wight and there's Nikki and, and the other lady that does burlesque. Um, so anyway, this is from Nikki. Uh, you'll remember Nikki. She says, love, love the music. Don't change it, please. Oh, we forgot about the music. I'm sticking with the music. I like it. Uh, do you like it? I do like I do like, like to it. consult you and everything. Yeah. Um, and then ignore me. Shut up. I so look forward to Friday mornings. The pair of you balance each other out with your banter. But I do have to say, do not stand still now. You just don't know what's around the corner. You have to live for today. Uh, really like my last email saying we took early retirement and we were traveling in the motor home and abroad. And I remember that email. Then Nikki says, life turned on us on our heads five months ago. We were knocked off our feet with my hubby being diagnosed with a terminal illness, never having had been ill in 37 years. Now we can't fly or go on holiday. Um, Thank God for grabbing life by the balls at 60 and living our best life. We have great memories to draw on, on our difficult days. Uh, Keep doing what you're doing. That's just put the shivers through me, God. Right, we're going to speak to Dave after this. Dave, are you still with us? Have you been Googling gold vibrators? I have. I'm just seeing there's somebody walking into cash for gold in Barrowing Furnace and trying to chop one of those <laughs> in for, for the price of a takeaway. It's not going to happen, is it? But what was it this week as well? It was a Roman sex aid that's been found. And it was like a stone willy. That's why I was trying to see. Was it stone? I thought it was wooden. No, no, no. no. He had splinters. I think, it was, I think it was stone. Then my, mother had a dar- How- my, mother had, my mother had a darling mushroom. But she ever had one of the other things. So I'm right in saying, am I, that after 20 odd years in a makeup room, which is the part of your life that is really discussed, because of course you're so well known as, as a cook and one of the hairy bikers, but that must have made you unshockable, Dave. Yeah, 23 years I worked as a makeup artist. I was the first male makeup artist employed at Television Centre in London. And when I applied for the job, I applied for anything an art graduate could. And um, <clears throat> I'd seen all the Hollywood films and seen the Westmores and all the dynasties of families. And they're all blokes doing makeup. So I applied and went there. And I remember on my application day, walking past the TARDIS, the Blue Peter ship, and saying to somebody, I says, what's it like working here then? And she said, oh, it's great. I'm, I'm just off with the two Ronnies on the Canberra in the Caribbean for six weeks. So it sounds all right. So, you know, I managed to get the job. I got us five years staff there before I went freelance um, in that predominantly female environment, shall we say. And were you comfortable in that environment? Because not every guy would. I know I'm sounding really, really sexist here, and yeah. I don't mean to, but you come from a pretty blue-collar oh, yeah. background, don't you do? I mean, I would imagine being a TV makeup artist was pretty unusual for a boy from Barrow and Furness. It was bizarre. <clears throat> what was funny was when I, when I applied for the job back in those days, they wanted to have a reference from uh, an employer that wasn't education. You know, you had to be seen to have done something. And I had a reference to the, I used to work in the steelworks every summer in Barrow. And one of my references was from British Steel. And it was so funny sitting there on the sixth <laughs> floor at Old Television Centre. And I look at my reference and the, the British Steel one went on about me timekeeping and hard working abilities. And it was a gentleman called Jack Elliott who was the boss in those days. You know, there was a lot of sniffing around the room. And he said, look, if a lad can stand the steelworks, he can stand working here. And I think that's what got <laughs> me the job, really. But it was it was odd coming from Barrow into that environment, really. You know, one one minute it was the lads at the steelworks, next minute I was with Legs and Co. That's weird, Legs and Co. <laughs> oh, no, I'm thinking of Pans people. Same thing, isn't it? I was I was both, saying, yes, later on. I, was, I never got Pans people. I was 
was <laughs> not long ago. There was a bit of competition, actually, now that you mentioned that, between right. and cord pants people. I think you were definitely kind of like one or the other. But so as a wee boy in Barrow, were, were you somebody who was dreaming of a glamorous lifestyle of being a star of you know, of Hollywood, of all these kind of things? Um, no, I, I, was, I wanted to be a painter, an artist. You know, my dad worked in a paper mill and um, he was, they were making printing paper. So we had, we had loads of paper at home, you know, because my dad would bring home loads of paper. So I just drew and drew and drew when I was a kid. And um, there was a friend of mine, Graham Twyford, who's an artist. He was the year above me at school. And I kind of followed in Graham's wake. He went down to Goldsmiths to do painting and everything that Graham did, I wanted to do too. Uh, that, that's how it happened, really. It was art. So what kind of influence were your mum and dad on all of, of this? I mean, did they think this was a an unusual son that they had or were they encouraging you in this direction? They encouraged me with my art and my drawing. But, you know, my mum had multiple sclerosis from when I was eight years old. So to be fair, from when I was eight, it was her health that became the focus of attention for the family. And so I suppose I grew up a carer, really. And, you know, my mum, I, I come home from school, my dad had a stroke when I was 17 when I was doing my A-levels. Well, my mum went into hospital then, and um, she never came out. And I kind of looked after my dad, but then I, I went to art school. Now, that was it. It was on my own since then, really. He, he died not long after. You seem very accepting of, of that, your, your, your mum and dad's illness and your role as a carer now. Obviously, lots of years have passed. Were you as accepting at the time? Oh, no, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the thing. It's a real inconvenience to your life as an adolescent. So no, you, you realise that there's love in the family and you have to do your bit. But no, it's hard. And, and I think, you know, there's so many young carers these days. And, you know, the, it, it literally was quite hard. When my dad had his stroke, um, I always remember that the doctor came around and said, uh, well, one of them can go to hospital. Which one do you think you can look after? And this was okay. about a few months before my A-levels. And I knew my mum wouldn't get better, my dad would. So I said, well, you know, I have to be my mum, really. And that, that's quite quite hard, quite big potatoes, really, for a kid. And, um, you know, I do resent that now. I still resent that. I think that was really clumsy and cruel. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, thing, things like that were bad, could have been done better, with a bit more kindness. But as I said, I had good friends and, you know, people around me that helped me which I'm forever grateful, really. I mean, obviously, they, unfortunately, your, your mum developed MS and your, your yeah, dad I... a stroke. You didn't have long with your parents in good health. How no. did you deal with that? My dad was amazing because he was, again, he was a lot, he was an old father in those days. He was 55 when I was born, uh, which was, you know, 55 in 1957 was quite a, an age, but he was the best. That's why sometimes I now um, I meet mates who were getting on for 60 and having a kid and um I was just go for it you know because my dad was that he was the best father ever because he had time for me he was yeah. interesting going to the pub or whatever he would you know I'd go out on motorbikes I started my motor love of motorbikes with him he'd take me fishing and to the beach every night even my mum was ill every night in the summer we'd go somewhere on the motorbike you know this is you know up until say 14 and um he was the best best dad ever. Um, you know, he, he was That's brilliant, brilliant man, proper bloke. Do you think, I mean, I'm thinking about your Agony Uncle podcast and, and just the way that you seem to approach life, you know, quite kind of accepting and philosophical. Do you think that those experiences that you had have kind of made you that, that person? Made you the perfect Agony Uncle? No, I think it makes you, I think it makes you really worry. Um I, I always think, you know, looking back now in the 60s, I've worried too much in my life because I think that kind of upbringing gives you a vulnerability and an insecurity that um, isn't very healthy going forward, you know. Um, this is probably I, I wish sometimes, like at work, I'd have told more people to stuff it <laughs> rather than put up with it, you know, because you you don't want that insecurity, you want employment and, you know, being, you know, skinned, really. But as I said, it was good friends and when I came to London and, you know, the, the, I did love my art and my paintings and, and my pals and, and, you know, London was a very exciting place to be in the, in the late 70s. You know, punk yeah. was just starting. Goldsmiths was an incredible place to be. Although I wanted to be a pre-Raphaelite, so I didn't really fit in there after. But I suppose, given 
you know, the situation with your parents, although it's exciting, amazing to be there as a young man at that time, you didn't really have somebody to kind of pick you up if you fell down, apart no. from your friends. No, I never, never had anything like that. And that was, that's, that's a huge worry. That's one thing I love. You know, I've got two stepchildren and that have been around for years now. And um, I was saying to my wife, you know, the great thing is for them, they will never have to feel like that, that, the, you know, there's, there's a potential of being out on the streets or unemployed or homeless, you know, because through us, they will always have a bed. And I think yeah. that's, that, that's a great thing to be able to give. And I do appreciate that. So I did go through a period in London where I was lived pretty, you know, close to the edge, really, financially. And um, not many safety nets out there if you haven't got any parental support. Um, that was very little, really. Uh, Dave, I have to say, I couldn't help but think of you when I saw Nikki's email that, that came in. You know, saying that she and her husband were having a whale of a time off in their motor home. You know, they bang. were just at 60. And then, bang, her husband you know, sadly has got um, a terminal diagnosis and, and everything is just turned upside down. With you, you were diagnosed with, with cancer. It came as a bolt from the blue. How did you deal with that? It's, it's horrendous. It was like the end of March last year, it came as a bolt from the blue. And I was told, I was lucky enough to have a house in France, driving down to France. I had the scan that morning and I had a phone call on the motorway in France, half past eight at night, and they told me I got cancer. And um, I was like, oh, shit. And um, and it was like, oh, well, we'll sort of plan out. But I must admit, there was the most, most uncomfortable week while with Zoom calls. And then I came back and, you know, started the path I'm on now, really. I'm still having chemotherapy. But what I'm finding out now is like many people, you have to live with the cancer. A little bit like uh, somebody described it. It's, a you know, a, a diabetic will need insulin you know, constant care. That's the state I'm in now. And it's funny, we're saying about turning 60. I've always been all right with age. Well, by God, the chemotherapy doesn't age. It doesn't have to age you quickly, you know, that side of it, you know, because you, your balance goes. And so obviously on a motorbike, that's a disaster. And my walking's been, you know, my walking's been affected quite a lot, really. Um, but I'm going to go back to film this May. You know, we're going to go back filming. And fortunately enough, we're going to film around the chemo. Um, so that's, that's, that's just the way it is really, you know, one doesn't have an option at the minute, but all I can say is that, um, you know, it's not spreading and it's, I'm holding the own. Okay. Um, mm. so I'm very grateful for that. And, um, I said my first foray out into the outside world, you know, two weeks ago, I drove to Romania to see my in-laws and that oh, was brilliant. You know, I loved it. You know, the whole family came, started with myself and my wife and then, Daughter decided she wanted to come, and Stone Sun came. So there was, it was like, um, well, it was like the Beverly Hillbillies, really. We had so much stuff in the car, <laughs> but it was great fun, you know, and it's nice. I do appreciate things now an awful lot more. I said to my wife now, I won't whinge ever again. If I get through this, I'll never whinge. I promise I'll never whinge. But, uh, she said she doesn't believe me, though. My wife has been such an amazing, strong support. You know, like on my chemo days, she's, you know, I don't feel too great coming home, so I won't go on my own. But she'll 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 stay there all the time for me, and um, she's the one to bring me home. And sometimes it's funny; I, I feel fine, and I, you know, other times I just need to go to bed, and then I kind of sleep it off. Really, it's a bit like a, a bad hangover. You know, you, if if you can get yourself to bed and sleep through it, drink plenty of water, then it's kind of all right. You know, you just get on with things. But things like the, you know, she's fought like a mother hen for me. Um, you know, fighting for her chicks, really. I can see that in her sometimes. So watching my back and looking out for me. And um, But I do feel I'm getting better, you know, and I know I am in terms of mobility and physiotherapy. You know, because this is the side thing nobody tells you. <laughs> when you've got the age thing to go to. Uh, the cancer, I really have no symptoms of it. It's the chemotherapy, you know. It, it's neuropathy in your feet. So therefore, it's hard to stand so I've had to really learn to walk again properly. Um, I bought a new motorbike. That's arrived on Friday. So I've got to ride the bloody thing again. I mean, they've had this thing at physiotherapy where they sit me on a Pilates ball and rock me from side to side pretending I'm on the motorbike. And I have a rubber band under one foot, a rubber band under the other. And I'm changing gear and braking like this and making motorbike noises. And then 
you know, it's some good people. They're determined to get me back on the bike. Are you just sort of seeing this as something to get through? It's, you know, not great, but there you go. You're going to deal with it and crack on with life. Yes, I think that's that's how my wife sees it. There's something to got through. I think maybe at this point, I'm taking things step at a time that, you know, I'm getting on with life. I'm feeling okay. And I'm going back to work, which is really important to me, you know, because I've got this relationship with Cy going back 30 years. And, um, you know, looking forward to it. And the funny thing is, you'll know it's like in television. I mean, like we're, we're, we're bikes have been going now for nearly 20 years, it's done 30 series. And we've got a team of people around us who actually like being together. And, um, you know, looking forward to getting back on the road again with the same producers, directors, researchers. You know, we're a good old team, you know. And, um, mm. I don't give my wife a break as well. You know, we're, we're, the film's shorter days and, you know, they're being very helpful. Uh, but it's going to give it's going to give Lil, my wife, a, a bit of a break as well for like three, four day stretches when uh-huh. I'm away. But, you know, I, I'd, I'd be okay to cope with that, I'm sure. I mean, like with you and Sai, how would you describe your relationship? Like brothers, really. A lot, awful lot of give and take and you just kind of take stuff on the chin. We could be, you know, it's funny... We've, we've been friends since 1992 we met, so it was 10 years before the bikers. And um, I think we, we kind of, we've always got on in a brotherly way. You know, and Cy would come up to the Highlands when I was living up there. He'd finish a job. He worked as film crew as well. And he'd tell it, say to his wife, oh, I'm just going to go and see Dave and hang out and get my head together. Mm-hmm. And so he, we'd, we'd motorcycle up from Newcastle up to Aberdeenshire. Then we'd go off on the bikes, fishing and eating and cooking. You know, doing much, much what we do for a living, really. Um, but yeah, over the years, I mean, we've become business partners as well, which is very easy doing that with somebody that, you know, you, you, your lives are like a brother, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's not unlike with, with this, you know, it, it's, we're both looking forward to getting back to work. We've got to that point now in relationship where we do finish each other's sentences. <laughs> it's quite good, charming, really. So it's, it's such a wonderful thing to find in life, Dave. Aye, aye. Yeah, no, I'm very lucky. Oh, very lucky. It's funny. As I say, when I get the bike back, King is he's so desperate to get me back on the bike. And he says, when the bike's delivered, he said, I want to be there to, to help. And I'm determined that I'm just, just going to do it on my own, you know. But, um, and then sort of crack on with it, really. But, um, but no, it's good. I'm very, very lucky. And I think as well, is like we've got the best job in the world, you know, and, and that's why I'm really annoyed with this cancer business because there's that much... So many more adventures I want to have. I, I'm lucky. I know I'm lucky. I don't have to retire. You know, as long as people watch the programs and buy the books, I can crack on till I'm 110, as long as I can keep breathing. And, um, and you know, like when I have adventures with Kingy, it's it's great. And some of the shared adventures we've had and experiences over the past 20 years, you know, riding across the Namibian desert, I wouldn't do it now, but, you know, we've we've cooked in canyons in Mexico you know, we, we've ridden right across India, across the Cardamom Hills, and cooked and been wow. paid for it, you know. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. It's been that shared experience. And, and you know, we, it gives you strength as well. It gives you strength to on the business side, which does rear its head, obviously, because you've got to make a living. And, mm. um, just you know, we're very strong together, a good bond. And we know, I think we both know that our value together is tenfold what it would be as individuals. And that's mm. that's what's that, that that's really, you know, it gives us strength as well. We're very lucky. You've got a great attitude, though. I have to say, very positive. Yeah, I'd say this year it's come and goes. I, I mean, I, I, it, it's a funny thing chemotherapy. It's I suppose it's one of life's great levelers, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Doesn't matter whether mm. you're on the telly or you're on the door. Wow. You get that you're in the shit, and sometimes as well, the chemo does make you depressed, and it's a a type of chemical depression. So you've got, you know, you've got clinical, you've got depression being pissed off. But it's a chemical depression, and that's really hard because everybody's tending to be positive. You're on a positive attitude with your illness. But when the chemistry in your body's not telling you that story, that's, that's, that's harsh. But, but, you know, with help, you can get through it. And as it were, like I am now, having a way of life. Um, hopefully, it's, you know, it's a chapter that's just a level up, and there'll be more positive ones beyond this. Um, but it, you know, it sounds daft, it does get e- easier, but there are no books on this. You know, well, there are, I suppose, but nobody tells you what the, <laughs> what's going to happen. Yeah. Like, you know, you, okay, you said we did our podcast 
that I mentioned once um, that, oh, what was it, about your pubic hair and decoration, you know, and stuff. And I got this thing through on Facebook for manscaping, and it's a set of clippers for men to shave their nuts and bits to keep everything nice and tidy. Lovely, lovely. lovely. Yeah, well, so a few, a few weeks later, these very expensive apparatus arrived through the post, and there was me deep in the heart of chemotherapy. It was the last thing in the world I needed. You oh. Know, oh, I was like two billion balls down there. I didn't need anything like that. No, I look like an embryo. Um, it's really not, not a good look. But obviously, you know, it's funny. My hair's come back now. It's better than it was before the chemo, which I'm quite pleased about, really. Well, listen, you are certainly the best person ever to be an agony uncle. Can we run this little um, dilemma from you? Um, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't guarantee any positive. Yeah. Well, like I say, this was Charles who got in touch, and he yeah. and his wife, both early 60s, and he said that he's really keen to live a little, work less, travel. Uh, she wants to sort of keep working, keep the pennies, keep the, the lifestyle kind of, you know, um, pretty modest. And he said, what do we do to avoid a grey divorce? So clearly causing a bit of tension in the Compromise. relationship. Compromise. Compromise and discussion and meet each other halfway. Absolutely. Only where? You can have the best of both worlds. If she's happy to work and turn a shilling, then maybe he should just go off with his bets and do something and let her go to work. You know, it's not that they separate lives, you can lead parallel lives. We could have the best of both things. If 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 he was adamant to take like a month's holiday, she does it well have two weeks instead. You know? Compromise. Okay. Don't know if that's going to work. Com- really? Because <laughs> I don't know what this word means, compromise. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, imagine, I'll carry on working and then he goes off for a month or is it only a fortnight on his own? Yeah, not with his mates. He'd be resentful then. Oh, it's not going to work. All of those things could be worked out. I'm with you, Dave. Compromise. And it's not exactly my second nature yeah, either. Right. But I know, I think, I think you're onto something. Can we have a quick <laughs> game of Big Six O Bingo? So choose a number in between 1 and 50, Dave, please. 38. Have you got more to do, Dave, in terms what? of more to do? Life? Yes, exactly. Shit, yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah. The answer yeah. shit, yeah. No, yes, I've got a lot more to do, yeah. Going back to the right. television series this year, two books, and somehow I've got to compromise with my wife and take her on holiday, which i have quite happily come home, but I have to compromise, don't I? She wants to go somewhere hot. You would never get on with a guy like Dave because he's impossible to annoy. <laughs> <laughs> Give me Twice time. my wife, I should tell you a different story. <laughs> right, fire off another number. Look at number seven. Lucky number seven. Look at Kate edging in, wanting to know what I'm going to ask. Best year of your life? I think it was um, when I turned 50. It was when the wow. bike has started. I, that's when I met my future wife. Um, the bike has started that first year. I would say <clears throat> around that year because we had this thing where we did the pilot for the bikers. It was our idea. There's two great producers who helped us. And then all of a sudden, I was working on Spooks, that, that series, and I was a makeup designer on that. I got a phone call saying, congratulations, lads. You've got a million pounds to spend on beer, food, and petrol. That was the budget for the program, not us. We didn't get that. So we just picked six places around the world where we went to, oh. wanted to go, uh, from Mexico to India, Namibia. And Transylvania was episode three, and that's when I met my wife. So that was a pretty good idea. So life really that, did begin at, say, 49 to 50. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. It was that a, is a, what a lovely, good lovely year. Story. Good year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With your best mate going around the world. Oh. Took a lot to beat that one. A very good year indeed. And hopefully lots more to come. That's it from us. Next week is just me and her and your emails. Got lots coming in, which is absolutely great. Please, please keep them coming. Tell us about how you are tackling life around the Big Six O. And if you've got any suggestions for us on guests or subjects, we would love to hear them too. It's podcast at htb60.com. <laughs>